Triplanetary, first in the Lensman series by E. E. Doc Smith. Chapter 10 Within the Red Veil Nebia, the home planet of the marauding spaceship, would have appeared peculiar indeed to terrestrial senses. High in the deep red heavens a fervent blue sun poured down its flood of brilliant purplish light upon a world of water. Not a cloud was to be seen in that flaming sky. And through that dustless atmosphere the eye could see the horizon, a horizon three times as distant as the one to which we are accustomed, with a distinctness and clarity impossible in our terror's dust-filled air. As the mighty sun dropped below the horizon, the sky would fill suddenly with clouds, and rain would fall violently and steadily until midnight. Then the clouds would vanish as suddenly as they had come into being, the torrential downpour would cease, and through that huge world's wonderfully transparent gaseous envelope the full glory of the firmament would be revealed. Not the firmament as we know it, for that hot blue sun and Nebia, her one planet child, were light years distant from old Sol and his numerous brood, but a strange and glorious firmament containing few constellations familiar to earthly eyes. Out of the vacuum of space a fish-shaped vessel of the void, the vessel that was to attack so boldly both the massed fleet of Triplanetary and Roger's planetoid, plunged into the rarefied outer atmosphere, and crimson beams of force tore shriekingly through the thin air as it braked its terrific speed. A third of the circumference of Nebia's mighty globe was traversed before the velocity of the craft could be reduced sufficiently to make a landing possible. Then, approaching the twilight zone, the vessel dived vertically downward, and it became evident that Nebia was neither entirely aqueous nor devoid of intelligent life for the blunt nose of the spaceship was pointing toward what was evidently a half-submerged city, a city whose buildings were flat-topped hexagonal towers, exactly alike in size, shape, color, and material. These buildings were arranged as the cells of a honeycomb would be if each cell were separated from its neighbors by a relatively narrow channel of water, and all were built of the same white metal. Many bridges and more tubes extended through the air from building to building, and the watery streets teemed with swimmers, with surface craft, and with submarines. The pilot, stationed immediately below the conical prow of the spaceship, peered intently through thick windows which afforded unobstructed vision in every direction. His four huge contractile eyes were active each operating independently in sending its own message to his peculiar but capable brain. One was watching the instruments, the others scanned narrowly the immense swelling curve of the ship's belly, the water upon which his vessel was to land, and the floating dock to which it was to be moored. Four hands, if hands they could be called, manipulated levers and wheels with infinite delicacy of touch, and with scarcely a splash, the immense mass of the Nevian vessel struck the water and glided to a stop within a foot of its exact berth. Four mooring bars dropped neatly into their sockets, and the captain pilot, after locking his controls in neutral, released his safety straps and leaped lightly from his padded bench to the floor. Scuttling across the floor and down a runway upon his four short, powerful, heavily scaled legs, he slipped smoothly into the water and flashed away far below the surface. For Nevians are true amphibians. Their blood is cold, they use with equal comfort and efficiency gills and lungs for breathing. Their scaly bodies are equally at home in the water or in the air. Their broad flat feet serve equally well for running about upon a solid surface or for driving their streamlined bodies through the water at a pace few fishes can equal. Through the water the Nevian commander darted along, steering his course accurately by means of his short, veined tail. Through an opening in a wall he sped and along a submarine hallway, emerging upon a broad ramp. He scurried up the incline and into an elevator, which lifted him to the top of the hexagon, 
directly into the office of the Secretary of Commerce of all Nevia. Welcome, Captain Narado. The secretary waved a tentacular arm, and the visitor sprang lightly upon a softly cushioned bench where he lay at ease, facing the official across his low flat desk. We congratulate you upon the success of your final trial flight. We received all your reports, even while you were traveling at ten times the velocity of light. With the last difficulties overcome, you are now ready to start? We are ready, the captain scientist replied soberly. Mechanically, the ship is as nearly perfect as our finest minds can make her. She is stocked for two years. All the iron-bearing suns within reach have been plotted. Everything is ready except the iron. Of course the Council refused to allow us any of the national supply. How much were you able to purchase for us in the market? Nearly ten pounds. Ten pounds! Why, the securities we left with you could not have bought two pounds, even at the price then prevailing. No, but you have friends. Many of us believe in you, and have dipped into our own resources. You and your fellow scientists of the expedition have each contributed his entire personal fortune. Why should not some of the rest of us also contribute as private citizens? Wonderful! We thank you! Ten pounds! The captain's great triangular eyes glowed with an intense violet light. At least a year of cruising! But— what if, after all, we should be wrong? In that case, you shall have consumed ten pounds of irreplaceable metal. The secretary was unmoved. That is the viewpoint of the Council, and of almost everyone else. It is not the waste of treasure they object to. It is the fact that ten pounds of iron will be forever lost. A high price, truly, the Columbus of Nevia assented. And after all, I may be wrong. You probably are wrong, his host made startling answer. It is practically certain, it is almost a demonstrable mathematical fact, that no other sun within hundreds of thousands of light-years of our own has a planet. In all probability, Nevia is the only planet in the entire universe. We are probably the only intelligent life in the universe. There is only one chance in numberless millions that, anywhere within the cruising range of your newly perfected spaceship, there may be an iron-bearing planet upon which you can effect a landing. There is a larger chance, however, that you may be able to find a small, cold, iron-bearing cosmic body, small enough so that you can capture it. Although there are no mathematics by which to evaluate the probability of such an occurrence, it is upon that larger chance that some of us are staking a portion of our wealth. We expect no return whatever, but if you should, by some miracle, happen to succeed, what then? Deep seas being made shallow, civilization extending itself over the globe, science advancing by leaps and bounds, Nevia becoming populated as she should be peopled, that, my friend, is a chance well worth taking. The secretary called in a group of guards who escorted the small package of priceless metal to the spaceship. Before the massive door was sealed, the friends bade each other farewell. I will keep in touch with you on the ultra wave, the captain concluded. After all, I do not blame the council for refusing to allow the other ship to go out. Ten pounds of iron will be a fearful loss to the world. If we should find iron, however, see to it that she loses no time in following us. No fear of that. If you find iron, she will set out at once, and all space will soon be full of vessels. Goodbye. The last opening was sealed, and Narado shot the great vessel into the air. Up and up, out beyond the last tenuous trace of atmosphere, on and on through space it flew with ever-increasing velocity, until Nebia's gigantic blue sun had been left so far behind that it became a splendid blue-white star. Then projectors cut off to save the precious iron whose disintegration furnished them power, for week after week Captain Narado and his venturesome crew of scientists drifted idly through the illimitable void. 
there is no need to describe in detail nerado's tremendous voyage suffice it to say that he found a g-type dwarf star possessing planets not one planet only but six seven eight yes at least nine and most of those worlds were themselves centers of attraction around which were circling one or more worldlets nerado thrilled with joy as he applied a full retarding force and every creature aboard that great vessel had to peer into a plate or through a telescope before he could believe that planets other than nevia did in reality exist velocity checked to the merest crawl as space speeds go and with electromagnetic detector screens full out the nevian vessel crept toward our sun finally the detectors encountered an obstacle a conductive substance which the patterns showed conclusively to be practically pure iron an enormous mass of it floating alone out in space without waiting to investigate the nature appearance or structure of the precious mass nerado ordered power into the converters and drove an enormous softening field of force upon the object a force of such a nature that it would condense the metallic iron into an allotropic modification of much smaller bulk a red viscous extremely dense and heavy liquid which could be stored conveniently in his tanks no sooner had the precious liquid been stored away than the detectors again broke into an uproar in one direction was an enormous mass of iron scarcely detectable in another a great number of smaller masses in a third an isolated mass comparatively small in size space seemed to be full of iron and nerado drove his most powerful beam to our distant nevia and sent an exultant message we have found iron easily obtained and in unthinkable quantity not in fractions of milligrams but in millions upon unmeasured millions of tons send our sister ship here at once nerado the captain was called to one of the observation plates as soon as he had opened his key i have been investigating the mass of iron now nearest us the small one it is an artificial structure a small space boat and there are three creatures in it monstrosity certainly but they must possess some intelligence or they could not be navigating space what impossible exclaimed the chief explorer probably then the other was but no matter we had to have the iron bring the boat in without converting it so that we may study at our leisure both the beings and their mechanisms and nerado swung his own busy ray beam into the emergency boat seeing there the armored figures of cleo marston and the two triplanetary officers they are indeed intelligent nerado commented as he detected and silenced costigan's ultra beam communicator not however as intelligent as i had supposed he went on after studying the peculiar creatures and their tiny spaceship more in detail they have immense stores of iron yet use it for nothing other than building material they make little and inefficient use of atomic energy they apparently have a rudimentary knowledge of ultra waves but do not use them intelligently they cannot neutralize even these ordinary forces we are now employing they are of course more intelligent than the lower ganoids or even than some of the higher fishes but by no stretch of the imagination can they be compared to us i am quite relieved i was afraid that in my haste i might have slain members of a highly developed race the helpless boat all her forces neutralized was brought up close to the immense flying fish there flaming knives of force sliced her neatly into sections and the three rigid armored figures after being bereft of their external weapons were brought through the airlocks and into the control room while the pieces of their boat were stowed away for a future study the nevian scientists first analyzed the air inside the spacesuits of the terrestrials then carefully removed the protective coverings of the captives costigan fully conscious through it all and now able to move a little since the peculiar temporary paralysis was wearing off 
braced himself for he knew not what shock, but it was needless. Their grotesque captors were not torturers. The air, while somewhat more dense than earth, and of a peculiar odor, was eminently breathable, and even though the vessel was motionless in space, an almost normal gravitation gave them a large fraction of their usual weight. After the three had been relieved of their pistols and other articles which the Nevians thought might prove to be weapons, the strange paralysis was lifted entirely. The earthling clothing puzzled the captors immensely, but so strenuous were the objections raised to its removal that they did not press the point, but fell back to study their find in detail. Then faced each other the representatives of the civilizations of two widely separated solar systems. The Nevians studied the human beings with interest and curiosity, blended largely with loathing and repulsion. The three terrestrials regarded the unmoving, expressionless faces, if those coned heads could be said to possess such thing, with horror and disgust, as well as with other emotions, each according to his type and training. For to human eyes the Nevian is a fearful thing. Even today there are few terrestrials, or Solarians for that matter, who can look at a Nevian eye to eye without feeling a creeping of the skin, and experience a gone sensation in the pit of the stomach. The horny, wrinkled, drought-resisting Martian, whom we all know and rather like, is a hideous being indeed. The bat-eyed, colorless, hairless, practically skinless Venerian is worse. But they both are, after all, remote cousins of Terra's humanity, and we get along with them quite well whenever we are compelled to visit Mars or Venus. But the Nevians! The horizontal, flat, fish-like body is not so bad, even supported as it is by four short, powerful, scaly, flat-footed legs, and terminating as it does in the weird, four-veined tail. The neck even is endurable, although it is long and flexible, heavily scaled, and is carried in whatever eye-ringing loops or curves the owner considers most convenient or ornamental at the time. Even the smell of a Nevian, a malodorous reek of overripe fish, does in time become tolerable, especially if sufficiently disguised with creosote, which purely terrestrial chemical is the most highly prized perfume of Nevia. But the head. It is that member that makes the Nevian so appalling to earthly eyes, for it is a thing utterly foreign to all Solarian history or experience. As most Tellurians already know, it is fundamentally a massive cone, covered with scales, based spear-like upon the neck. Four great sea-green triangular eyes are spaced equidistant from each other about halfway up the cone. The pupils are contractile at will, like the eyes of the cat, permitting the Nevian to see equally well in any ordinary extreme of light or darkness. Immediately below each eye springs out a long, jointless, boneless, tentacular arm, an arm which at its extremity divides into eight delicate and sensitive but very strong fingers. Below each arm is a mouth, a beaked, needle-tusked orifice of dire potentialities. Finally, under the overhanging edge of the cone-shaped head, are the delicately frilled organs which serve either as gills or as nostrils and lungs as may be desired. To other Nevians the eyes and other features are highly expressive, but to us they appear utterly cold and unmoving. Terrestrial senses can detect no changes of expression in a Nevian's face. Such were the frightful beings at whom the three prisoners stared with sinking hearts. But if we human beings have always considered Nevians grotesque and repulsive, the feeling has always been mutual. For these monstrous beings are a highly intelligent and extremely sensitive race, and our, to us, trim and graceful human forms seem to them the very quintessence of malformation and hideousness. "'Good heavens, Conway!' Cleo exclaimed, shrinking against Costigan as his left arm flashed around her. What horrible monstrosities! And they can't talk. 
Not one of them has made a sound. Suppose they can be deaf and dumb? But at the same time Narado was addressing his fellows. What hideous, deformed creatures they are! Truly a low form of life, even though they do possess some intelligence. They cannot talk, and have made no signs of having heard our words to them. Do you suppose that they communicate by sight? That those weird contortions of their peculiarly placed organs serve as speech? Thus both sides, neither realizing that the other had spoken. For the Nevian voice is pitched so high that the lowest tone audible to them is far above our limit of hearing. The shrillest note of a terrestrial piccolo is to them so profoundly low that it cannot be heard. We have much to do. Nerado turned away from the captives. We must postpone further study of the specimens until we have taken aboard a full cargo of iron which is so plentiful here. What shall we do with them, sir? asked one of the Nevian officers. Lock them in one of the storage rooms? Oh, no, uh, they might die there, and we must by all means keep them in good condition, to be studied most carefully by the fellows of the College of Science. What a commotion there will be when we bring in this group of strange creatures, living proof that there are other suns possessing planets, planets which are supporting organic and intelligent life. You may put them in three communicating rooms, say, in the fourth section. They will undoubtedly require light and exercise. Lock all the exits, of course, but it would be best to leave the doors between the rooms unlocked so that they can be together or apart as they choose. Since the smallest one, the female, stays so close to the larger male, it may be that they are mates. But since we know nothing of their habits or customs, it will be best to give them all possible freedom compatible with safety. Nerado turned back to his instruments, and three of the frightful crew came up to the human beings. One walked away, waving a couple of arms, in an unmistakable signal that the prisoners were to follow him. The three obediently set out after him, the other two guards falling behind. "'Now's our best chance,' Costigan muttered, as they passed through a low doorway and entered a narrow corridor. "'Watch that one ahead of you. Cleo, hold him for a second if you can. Bradley, you and I will take the two behind us. Now!' Costigan stooped and whirled. Seizing a cable-like arm, he pulled the outlandish head down, the while the full power of his mighty right leg drove a heavy service boot into the place where scaly neck and head joined. The Nevian fell, and instantly Costigan leaped at the leader ahead of the girl. Leaped, but dropped to the floor, again paralyzed. For the Nevian leader had been alert, his four eyes covering the entire circle of vision, and he had acted rapidly. Not in time to stop Costigan's first berserk attack, the first officer's reactions were practically instantaneous, and he moved fast, but in time to retain command of the situation. Another Nevian appeared, and while the stricken guard was recovering, all four arms wrapped tightly around his convulsing, looping, writhing neck, the three helpless terrestrials were lifted into the air and carried bodily into the quarters to which Narado had assigned them. Not until they had been placed upon cushions in the middle room and the heavy metal doors had been locked upon them did they again find themselves able to use arms or legs. "'Well, that's another round we lose,' Costigan commented cheerfully. "'A guy can't mix it very well when he can neither kick, strike, nor bite. I expected those lizards to rough me up then, but they didn't. They don't want to hurt us. They want to take us home with them, wherever that is, as curiosities, like wild animals or something, decided the girl shrewdly. They're pretty bad, of course, but I like them a lot better than I do Roger and his robots, anyway. I think you have the right idea, Miss Marston, Bradley rumbled. That's it exactly. I feel like a bear in a cage. I should think you'd feel worse than ever. What chance has an animal of escaping from a menagerie? These animals? Lots. I'm feeling better and better all the time, Cleo declared. And her serene bearing bore out her words. You, too, got us out of that horrible place of Rogers, and I'm pretty sure that you will get us away from here, somehow or other. They may think we're stupid animals, 
but before you two and the Triplanetary Patrol and the Service get done with them, they'll have another think coming. That's the old fight, Cleo, cheered Costigan. I haven't got it figured out as close as you have, but I get about the same answer. These four-legged fish carry considerably heavier stuff than Roger did, I'm thinking, but they'll be up against something themselves pretty quick that is no lightweight, believe me. Do you know something, or are you just whistling in the dark? Bradley demanded. I know a little, not much. The engineering and research have been working on a new ship for a long time. A ship to travel so much faster than light that it can go anywhere in the galaxy and back in a month or so. New sub-ether drive, new atomic power, new armament, new everything. Only bad thing about it is that it doesn't work so good yet. It's fuller of bugs than a Venerian's kitchen. It has blown up five times that I know of and has killed twenty-nine men. But when they get it licked, they'll have something. When or if? asked Bradley pessimistically. I said when, snapped Costigan, his voice cutting. When the service goes after anything, they get it, and when they get it, it stays. He broke off abruptly, and his voice lost its edge. Sorry, didn't mean to get high, but I think we'll have help if we can keep our heads up a while. And it looks good. These are first-class cages they've given us. All the comforts of home, even to lookout plates. Let's see what's going on, shall we? After some experimenting with the unfamiliar controls, Costigan learned how to operate the Nebian Viziray. And upon the plate they saw the cone of battle hurling itself toward Roger's planetoid. They saw the pirate fleet rush out to do battle with Triplanetary's massed forces. And with bated breath they watched every maneuver of that epic battle to its savagely sacrificial end. And that same battle was being watched, also with the most intense interest, by the Nevians in their control room. "'It is indeed a bloodthirsty combat,' mused Narado at his observation plate. "'And it is peculiar, or rather probably only to be expected from a race of such a low stage of development, that they employ only ether-borne forces. Warfare seems universal among primitive types.' Indeed, it was not so long ago that our own cities, few in number though they are, ceased fighting each other and combined against the semi-civilized fishes of the greater deeps. He fell silent, and for many minutes watched the furious battle between the two navies of the void. That conflict ended, he watched the triplanetary fleet reform its battle cone and rush upon the planetoid. Destruction, always destruction, he sighed, adjusting his power switches. Since they are bent upon mutual destruction, I can see no purpose in refraining from destroying all of them. We need the iron, and they are a useless race. He launched his softening, converting field of dull red energy. Vast as that field was, it could not encompass the whole fleet, but half of the lip of the gigantic cone soon disappeared its component vessels subsiding into a sluggishly flowing stream of allotropic iron. The fleet, abandoning its attack upon the planetoid, swung its cone around to bring the flame-erupting axis to bear upon the formless something dimly perceptible to the ultra-vision of Sam's observers. Furiously the gigantic composite beam of the massed fleet was hurled, nor was it alone. For Garlane had known, ever since the easy escape of his human prisoners, that something was occurring which was completely beyond his experience, although not beyond his theoretical knowledge. He had found the sub-ether closed. He had been unable to make his sub-ethereal weapons operative against either the three captives or the war vessels of the Triplanetary Patrol. Now, however, he could work in that sub-ethereal murk of the newcomers. A light trial showed him that if he so wished, he could use sub-ethereal offenses against them. What was the real meaning of those facts? He had become convinced that those three persons were no more human than was Roger himself. Who or what was activating them? It was definitely not Adorian workmanship. 
no Adorian would have developed those particular techniques, nor could possibly have developed them without his knowledge. What, then? To do what had been done necessitated the existence of a race as old and as capable as the Adorians, but of an entirely different nature, and according to Edor's vast information center, no such race existed, or ever had existed. Those visitors, possessing mechanisms supposedly known only to the science of Edor, would also be expected to possess the mental powers which had been exhibited. Were they recent arrivals from some other space-time continuum? Probably not. Edorian surveys had found no trace of any such life in any reachable plenum. Since it would be utterly fantastic to postulate the unheralded appearance of two such races at practically the same moment, the conclusion seemed unavoidable that these as yet unknown beings were the protectors, the activators, rather, of the two triplanetary officers and the woman. This view was supported by the fact that while the strangers had attacked Triplanetary's fleet and had killed thousands of Triplanetary's men, they had actually rescued those three supposedly human beings. The planetoid, then, would be attacked next. Very well, he would join Triplanetary in attacking them, with weapons no more dangerous to them than Triplanetary's own, the while preparing his real attack which would come later. Roger issued orders, and waited, and thought more and more intensely upon one point which remained obscure. Why, when the strangers themselves destroyed Triplanetary's fleet, had Roger been unable to use his most potent weapons against that fleet? Thus, then, for the first time in Triplanetary's history, the forces of law and order joined hands with those of piracy and banditry against a common foe. Rods, beams, planes, and stilettos of unbearable energy the doomed fleet launched, in addition to its terrifically destructive main beam. Roger hurled every material weapon at his command, but bombs, high-explosive shells, even the ultra-deadly atomic torpedoes alike were ineffective alike simply vanished in the redly murky veil of nothingness. And the fleet was being melted. In quick succession the vessels flamed red, shrank together, gave out their air, and merged their component iron into the intensely crimson, sullenly viscous stream which was flowing through the impenetrable veil against which both Triplanetarians and pirates were directing their terrific offense. The last vessel of the attacking cone having been converted, and the resulting metal stored away, the Nevians, as Roger had anticipated, turned their attention toward the planetoid. But that structure was no feeble warship. It had been designed by and built under the personal supervision of Garlane of Edor. It was powered, equipped, and armed to meet any emergency which Garlane's tremendous mind had been able to envision. Its entire bulk was protected by the shield whose qualities had so surprised Costigan, a shield far more effective than any Tellurian scientist or engineer would have believed possible. The voracious converting beam of the Nevians, below the level of the ether though it was, struck that shield and rebounded, defeated and futile, struck again, again rebounded, then struck and clung hungrily licking out over that impenetrable surface in darting tongues of flame as the surprised Dorado doubled and then quadrupled his power. Fiercer and fiercer the Nevian flood of force drove in. The whole immense globe of the planetoid became one scintillating ball of raw red energy, but still the pirate's shield remained intact. Gray Roger sat coldly motionless at his great desk, the top of which was now swung up to reveal a panel of massed and tiered instruments and controls. He could carry this load forever. But unless he was very wrong, this load would change shortly. What then? The essence that was Garlane could not be killed, could not even be hurt, by any physical, chemical, or nuclear force. 
should he stay with the planetoid to its end, and thus perforce return to Edor with no material evidence whatever? He would not. Too much remained undone. Any report based upon his present information could be neither complete nor conclusive, and reports submitted by Garlane of Edor to the coldly cynical and ruthlessly analytical innermost circle had always been and always would be both. It was a fact that there existed at least one non-Edorian mind which was the equal of his own. If one, there would be a race of such minds. The thought was galling. But to deny the existence of a fact would be the essence of stupidity. Since power of mind was a function of time, that race must be of approximately the same age as his own. Therefore the Edorian Information Center, which, by the inference of its completeness, denied the existence of such a race, was wrong. It was not complete. Why was it not complete? The only possible reason for two such races remaining unaware of the existence of each other would be the deliberate intent of one of them. Therefore, at some time in the past, the two races had been in contact for at least an instant of time. All Edorian knowledge of that meeting had been suppressed, and no more contacts had been allowed to occur. The conclusion reached by Garlane was a disturbing thing indeed, but being an Edorian he faced it squarely. He did not have to wonder how such a suppression could have been accomplished. He knew. He also knew that his own mind contained everything known to every ancestor since the first Edorian was. The probability was exceedingly great that if any such contact had ever been made, his mind would still contain at least some information concerning it, however carefully suppressed that knowledge had been. He thought, Back, back, further back, farther still. And as he thought, an interfering force began to pluck at him, as though palpable tongs were pulling out of line the mental probe with which he was exploring the hitherto unplumbed recesses of his mind. Ah, so you do not want me to remember? Roger asked aloud, with no change in any lineament of his hard gray face. I wonder, do you really believe that you can keep me from remembering? I must abandon this search for the moment, but rest assured that I shall finish it very shortly. Here is the analysis of his screen, sir. A Nevian computer handed his chief a sheet of metal bearing rows of symbols. Ah, a polycyclic, complete coverage. A screen of that type was scarcely to have been expected from such a low form of life, Nerado commented and began to adjust dials and controls. As he did so, the character of the clinging mantle of force changed. From red, it flamed quickly through the spectrum, became unbearably violet, then disappeared. And as it disappeared, the shielding wall began to give way. It did not cave in abruptly, but softened locally, sagging into a peculiar grouping of valleys and ridges, contesting stubbornly every inch of position lost. Roger experimented briefly with inertialessness. No use. As he had expected, they were prepared for that. He summoned a few of the ablest of his scientist slaves and issued instructions. For minutes a host of robots toiled mightily, then a portion of the shield bulged out and became a tube extending beyond the attacking layers of force a tube from which there erupted a beam of violence incredible, a beam behind which was every erg of energy that the gigantic mechanisms of the planetoid could yield, a beam that tore a hole through the redly impenetrable Nevian field and hurled itself upon the inner screen of the fish-shaped cruiser in frenzied incandescence. And was there, or was there not, a lesser eruption upon the other side, an almost imperceptible flash, as though something had shot from the doomed planetoid out into space. Narado's neck writhed convulsively as his tortured drivers whined and shrieked at the terrific overload, 
but Roger's effort was far too intense to be long maintained. Generator after generator burned out, the defensive screen collapsed, and the red converter beam attacked voraciously the unresisting metal of those prodigious walls. Soon there was a terrific explosion as the pent-up air of the planetoid broke through its weakening container, and the sluggish river of allotropic iron flowed in an ever larger stream, ever faster. It is well that we had an unlimited supply of iron. Narado almost tied a knot in his neck as he spoke in huge relief. With but the seven pounds remaining of our original supply, I fear that it would have been difficult to parry that last thrust. Difficult? asked the second in command. We would now be free atoms in space. But what shall I do with this iron? Our reservoirs will not hold more than half of it. And how about that one ship which remains untouched? Jettison enough supplies from the lower holds to make room for this lot. As for that one ship, let it go. We will be overloaded as it is, and it is of the utmost importance that we get back to Nevia as soon as possible. This, if Garlane could have heard it, would have answered his question. All Arisia knew that it was necessary for the camera ship to survive. The Nevians were interested only in iron, but the Adorian, being a perfectionist, would not have been satisfied with anything less than the complete destruction of every vessel of Triplanetary's fleet. The Nevian spaceship moved away, sluggishly now because of its prodigious load. In their quarters in the fourth section, the three terrestrials who had watched with strained attention the downfall and absorption of the planetoid stared at each other with drawn faces. Clio broke the silence. Oh, Conway, this is ghastly. It's it's just simply too damn perfectly horrible, she gasped, then recovered a measure of her customary spirit as she stared in surprise at Costigan's face. For it was thoughtful. His eyes were bright and keen. No trace of fear or disorganization was visible in any line of his hard young face. It's not so good, he admitted frankly. I wish I wasn't such a dumb cluck. If Lyman Cleveland or Fred Rodebush were here, they could help a lot. But I don't know enough about any of their stuff to flag a hand car. I can't even interpret that funny flash, if it really was a flash that we saw. Why bother about one little flash, after all that really did happen? asked Cleo curiously. You think Roger launched something? He couldn't have. I didn't see a thing, Bradley argued. I don't know what to think. I've never seen anything material sent out so fast that I couldn't trace it with an ultra-wave. But, on the other hand, Roger's got a lot of stuff that I never saw anywhere else. However, I don't see that it has anything to do with the fix we're in right now. But at that, we might be worse off. We're still breathing air, you notice. And if they don't blanket my wave, I can still talk. He put both hands into his pockets and spoke. Sams, Costigan, put me on a recorder, quick. I probably haven't got much time. And for ten minutes he talked, concisely and as rapidly as he could utter words, reporting clearly and exactly everything that had transpired. Suddenly he broke off, writhing in agony. Frantically he tore his shirt open and hurled a tiny object across the room. Wow! he exclaimed. They may be deaf but they can certainly detect an ultra-wave, and what an interference they can set up on it. No, I'm not hurt, he reassured the anxious girl, now at his side, but it's a good thing I had you out of the circuit. It would have jolted you loose from six or seven of your back teeth. Have you any idea where they're taking us? she asked soberly. No, he answered flatly, looking deep into her steadfast eyes. No use lying to you. If I know you at all, you'd rather take it standing up. That talk of Jovians and Neptunians is the bunk. Nothing like that ever grew in our Solarian system. All the signs say that we're going for a long ride. End of chapter 10